So, uh, but I do, I want to say just a few brief words um, as we're gathered together today because I feel like that's something that I need and want to do. Um, we're just going to look very briefly at three people. We've been talking for the last several weeks here at First Friends about fresh starts and really what's the ultimate fresh start but seeing the resurrected Jesus. And so today we're going to look at three just brief snapshots of people who saw the resurrected Christ. And I invite you, as we see these snapshots, these short stories, see if you can find yourself in these stories. We're going to look at skeptics, nostalgics, and desperate divers. So let's get started. Here's the first one in John chapter 20. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his, uh, the, his disciples, they were in the house again, and Thomas this time was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So here first we have Thomas the skeptic. A lot of times we label him as Doubting Thomas, which I think is a little unfair. He'd followed Jesus for three years, so to label him as Doubting Thomas for all of eternity is a little much. And listen, he is being asked to believe some crazy things, that there was a man who was very much dead, who is very much buried, and has now very much come back to life. And instead of taking his proof of life back to the Jewish leaders or the Roman leaders to assert his place, he's come back to talk to his fishermen and tax-collecting disciples. No wonder he is hesitant to believe. But I believe that Thomas is not actually opposed to believing, but he just needs to address some of his doubt first. He just needs to see more, does Thomas. Why do I think he is not actually opposed to believing? Because a week after his missed opportunity to see Jesus, he is still hanging out with the disciples. I think had Thomas been deeply opposed or disillusioned at this idea of a resurrection, why stick around with these guys and hear the story told over and over again, celebrating over and over the thing that he missed out on? Why would he be there? The fact that he's still with them makes me believe he still wants to believe, he just needs to see more. It reminds me of this deep truth. We can only survive on secondhand belief for so long. We need firsthand experience with Jesus and his resurrection power. You can only survive on secondhand belief for so long. Eventually, you need to have an experience with Jesus. George Fox, the founder of this whole Friends Quaker movement, said that Jesus is the one who can speak to each of our conditions. And Jesus, when he knows Thomas is doubting, what does he do? Does he chastise him? No. Does he shame him for doubting? No. Instead, Jesus enters into Thomas's doubt and he invites Thomas to actually come even closer. I think sometimes when we have people who doubt, we want to try and chastise them into belief or guilt them into believing. Jesus did neither of those things. He simply said, come closer to me and see for yourself. I believe that doubt cannot be driven away by punishment or guilt. It only dissolves when we are gestured, gestured to come near. And if we're trying to battle guilt by telling people they should feel guilty, or, or, or battle doubt by telling people they should feel guilty about their doubt, we're going about it all the wrong direction. Psalm 34 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? And when Thomas comes near, more than wanting to see Jesus' face, more than wanting to hear Jesus' voice, what does Thomas actually want most? He wants to see and touch the wounds of Christ. Well, I want to remind you today, church, you know what you are in this world? You are the body of Christ. And yes, you may be doubted sometimes. But I think we should take on the example of Jesus when the church, the body of Christ, is doubted today. Instead of getting angry and frustrated and just blaming people, we need to invite the world, come closer and see all of our scars. 
Ugh. Yeah, it's really uncomfortable, but it's what Jesus did and it's what we're called to do. Come closer, world. See our imperfections. They are everywhere. And yet we are still beloved by God. Thomas was a skeptic. Can you see yourself in his life? Now we have a nostalgic. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, at one the head and the other the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? But they've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, just tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to tell the disciples the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary was actually the first one to discover the stone had been rolled away, but before she went inside, she reported it to the disciples, and after a couple of those disciples inspected the scene and had their faith in the resurrection start to take root as a result, Mary was left alone to cry outside the tomb. Perhaps it was her deep grief that was not allowing her faith to begin to settle in just yet, or maybe her loss may have cut deeper because unlike some of those men who followed Jesus, she watched him go all the way to the cross. She saw the brutality in all of its fullness. Even the sight of two angels couldn't shake her sadness. So turning to leave, she sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. Why? Why does she not see Jesus? Now, somehow maybe Jesus was concealing his identity. He does it also on the road to Emmaus in another story. But I wonder, maybe, perhaps... She's looking for the old Jesus. And because she's looking for the old Jesus, she can't see the new Jesus. It says she thinks he's the gardener, which, by the way, he is the gardener, and that's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But he is the gardener of a new garden. She pleads, just show me where the body is so I can continue to mourn and to grieve. Show me where you've laid him. And it's when Jesus says her name, he says to her, Mary, that she's awakened to the fact that it's Jesus standing right there before her. Jesus then says something strange to Mary, doesn't he? He says, Mary, do not, what? Do not cling to me. Do not cling to me, Mary. Anybody ever read that and and found yourself going, why not? Why, Why not cling? Can you imagine the the condition Mary has been in and now realizing that Jesus is in front of her? It's like seeing, you know, those famous, um, uh, like, airport reunions. Like Like a sibling and a brother, maybe a brother they thought was lost and dead and now has somehow almost miraculously come back to life. Can you imagine stepping in the way of the sister and going, oh, hold on, don't cling. Don't cling. Why would Jesus say to Mary, don't cling to me, Mary? I think it's because God meets each one of us exactly where we are, and he speaks into our lives what we particularly need. I mean, Jesus said to Thomas, come closer and touch my wounds, and he says now to Mary, whoa, don't cling to me. Why? Because Mary's problem isn't doubt. Mary's problem is grief, and I would say a little bit of nostalgia. I heard a pastor talk about this recently. I was taken aback at this idea, and I see it here in the text, nostalgia, because I think that Mary believes that everything she's lost has now been restored, and that she can finally get things back to the way they used to be. Things can go back to the way they were now. The healing that he used to do, the teaching that he used to do, the spiritual authority that he spoke with, the challenge to the corrupt leadership of the time, they can finally get the band back together because Jesus is back and it's going to be just like it was. But Jesus looks at her and says, don't cling to me because he says, I have not yet ascended to the Father. In other words, Mary, 
things are not going back to the way they were, they will be better. We're not going to go back to the way things were, Mary, but I promise you things will get better. Do you ever find yourself being nostalgic for what used to be? Do you look longingly back at the way the world or the culture or the nation or the church was 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 years ago? Looking back on if we could just get back to the way things were. Spoiler alert, we will never get back to the way things were. It will never happen. And when we cling to the past, we, present ourse- we prevent ourselves from entering into what God is doing next because next will be better. So I think Jesus sometimes has to say to some of us still, don't cling. Yes, you can remember the past, you can celebrate it, but you will not get it back. But if you're open to it, God is still pulling the world towards a glorious conclusion by doing everything new. Mary is a nostalgic. Can you see yourself in her life? Here's the last one. The desperate diver is Peter in John chapter 21. Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were all together. I am going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. By the way, he's talking to experienced fishermen here. Can you imagine there? Listen, pal, we've been doing this all night and a long time. Thanks for your advice. But they did it. They did it anyway. They threw their net and they were unable to haul the net in because a large number of fish. The disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat. They were towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards away. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Peter's last personal interaction with Jesus did not go so well. If you know the story, you know that Jesus spoke of being betrayed near the end of his life, and Peter stood up and promised, I'll remain beside you, even if it means I have to die. And then when things got tough in the courtyard, Peter, Jesus was being questioned and accused, and Peter stood at a very comfortable distance and eventually denied that he even knew who Jesus was. So now Peter decides to fish, we're told. He's deciding to go back to what he knew. And the other disciples that are with him, over half of them, they say, we'll go with you. Now remember, these aren't all fishermen. Some of these guys are tax collectors. And so for them to say, yeah, we'll try fishing, to me it says, this group of people led by Simon Peter, they are aimless now, trying to figure out what to do next. And so they try fishing. And after a miraculous catch of fish, they realize that this helper from the shoreline is no ordinary person. In fact, it's Jesus. And who responds first? Peter. With a mix of impulsiveness and honor, he puts on his outer garment because as a fisherman, you would have stripped down to just your undergarment to do your labor. And he knows there's no, you can't meet the king of all glory with just your working clothes on. And so he puts his outer garment on, but then he jumps in the boat, even though it's only 100 yards to wait to, for the boat to get in. But Peter gets all wet trying to get to Jesus. I wonder if he wanted to have a chance to speak with Jesus alone before all the other disciples got there. I think maybe he wanted to mend what his pride and his fear had broken when he decided to stay at a comfortable distance from Jesus. And I want to ask you today, have you been standing on the fringe of devotion to Jesus? Do you gladly know the grace that he gives and yet find yourself unwilling to make the kind of commitment that lets those around you know that you have chosen to follow him? Jesus not only forgives Peter, though, 
he also gives him a purpose. No more fishing. Instead, Peter is told, you will feed my lambs. I think a reminder to us today that resurrection power not only gives you forgiveness and friendship with Christ, but it gives you purpose. Peter's transformed into someone who is so full of the Spirit that he ends up going and preaching sermons and thousands of people come to Christ. So today I want to ask you to read through these few questions on the screen as they come up. Just questions that ask you about the, the people that we read about this morning. Can you identify with Thomas? Have you been feeling skeptical? Well, I encourage you to draw near to Christ and his church. Can you identify with Mary? Have you been feeling nostalgic? I encourage you, ask God to give you a hunger to embrace the new things that he is doing. Or lastly, can you identify with Peter? Have you been feeling distant or disengaged from Jesus? I want you to know that he wants to forgive you and he wants to give you a sense of purpose for your life. So take a moment to bow your head, close your eyes, think about these things, and then just a moment or two I'm going to pray to close our time together this morning.